Uh, my name is Rosa Murava, and I came originally from France. I was actually born in Belgium, but my parents came to Paris when I was, I think, about six months old. So I was always in Paris until we came to America. <laughs> we were five children. Uh, at that time, four girls and one boy. My uh, brother was the eldest. And uh, I have a sister also who was born after the war. Uh, my father was a milliner, uh, a hat maker. We had two apartments in Paris. One apartment was, you were allowed only to reside there. The other apartment was half for an apartment and half for the factory. By 1942, uh, my younger sister was uh, two years old, two, three and a half. Uh, my sister Suzanne was ten, I was eight, and my brother was fourteen. And of course, the very famous date is July 16, 1942, when all the Jewish family in Paris were going to be arrested. For a long time, we always thought that it was a Nazi who came to arrest us, but actually it was the French police, uh, ordered, of course, by the German, who would want to do it, kept their lives, who didn't, lost it, I am sure. But my mother, when everybody heard about this, my mother thought that with five children they would never arrest her, but she was afraid for my father, so she hid my father. We had a friend, he was our butcher in the neighborhood, not Jewish, and he kept my father in his place, in his apartment. But they came to arrest us anyway. And they took us to a place called the Velodrome d'Hiver. What I remember is that while we were over there, the world must have gone around that the families were going to be deported first to Drancy and from Drancy to Auschwitz or other concentration camp. What I remember is that on the very top, I remember a man falling. And I have this in front of my eyes today. He must have heard this and he committed suicide. That's the only thing that I can think about. Well, I know I remember we didn't have much to eat and we slept on a hard floor because I guess we were not given much time to leave the apartment. I know that when we walk, we leave uh, Rue Vieille du Temple, and there was a long street called Rue de Bretagne, and I remember we were many people walking, and from what we found out later on, my father saw us, and he wanted to run to us, but his friend did not let him. He, he held him back. So my mother was a bit of a heavy woman. And it just happened that this day, my mother had her period. She told my brother, George, we found out later on exactly what happened. She said, George, I am going to scream like if I am in pain, but you have to know that I don't have any pain, so don't be worried about this. And my mother started to scream, and evidently she was bleeding. So the doctor came, and my mother said that she was going to have a baby, that she was expecting, and she didn't know how come she was bleeding. So the, they say, take this woman to the hospital. And they put my mother on a, on a gurney. A gurney, you say, yeah. And 
But my mother scream, my children, my children, and they say, get the children with her. So they took my mother to um, the Rothschild Hospital. Now over there, a doctor examined my mother, of course. Uh, there was no such thing as blood test or urine test. It was just, you examine the woman and you see if she's pregnant or not. And the doctor said, Madame, I do not see that you are pregnant. My mother said to him, Doctor, when my children, when I was expecting, I didn't know I was expecting for a long time because my babies were so tiny. Yeah, we were maybe eight pounds each, but my mother said my children were so small that it didn't show for a long time that I was expecting. Either the doctor did not know what to believe anymore, or did he take pity on my mother? We will never know. He agreed to say that my mother was two months pregnant. So my mother was in the hospital. Paperwork were sent to Germany to say that my mother was expecting and that I guess they thought that since France was at, under German occupation, that the child that was going to be born would be considered German. Now, in the meantime, my mother was in the hospital, but we children were taken to a place. The address was 15 Rue Lamarck. All the children from parents who had been either in concentration camp, or maybe the parents put them there. We stay there. We stay in that place, Rue Lamarck. My sister Suzanne, who was 10, she was the oldest. She was like the little mother for the two little ones, two and three year old. In the meantime, my mother in the hospital, uh, my mother was a woman who had well, today we call it ESP. She had this premonition, which my sisters and I, we do have this sometimes. We think about something, and then either the telephone would ring or what. My mother dreamed, she was dreaming, she told us that night, that there was a big hole. And at the bottom of the hole, her parents were there. We found out later on, my mother lost all her family. Only one sister was left. She lost everybody. Uh, there was a big hole and her parents were at the bottom of the hole and there was a ladder. And her father, and my mother was on top of the hole, and her father was going to go up the ladder to go and take her and that her mother says to him, do not go up, it is not her time yet. So, my mother in the hospital, somebody was shaking her shoulder. Madame Suica, wake up, wake up, you are going to be liberated. Well, my mother woke up, and it seems that the letter they sent to Germany, which sounds a little bit like a fairy tale, uh, but it is the truth, they say that my sister Monique, who was born in 1940, when the German occupied France, was considered German, and that the child that my mother was going to have, which my mother was not pregnant, will be considered German too. And that for that reason, they would let my mother go. Like I say, a strange story to hear. Luck was with us, with my mother, of course, to have such a mother. We managed to escape, and my mother managed to escape through the Rue de Saint-Ange. Without anything, you have to realize my mother had absolutely nothing. 
I mean, we had no money. We had, until today, I just don't know how my mother managed because we were one of the happy family that I cannot say, besides being in um, Velodrome d'Hiver, I cannot say that we ever starved like so many, so many people who just, including my husband, who many times had just a little piece of bread to eat. So, uh, in, uh, I'm trying to, yes, after in 19, well, it was still 1942. You see, in 1940, when the German came to occupy France, the Jewish people were told that they had to evacuate Paris. It was an exodus. And we all went to a place, uh, it is a department of France called the loire et cher and we were in a village called saint agile My mother was expecting actually, yeah, was expecting my sister, Simone, no, my sister Monique, yeah, Monique is born in saint Agile. She was expecting my youngest sister at that time. I have one that was born after the war. And we came to a place. It was actually a, a real count, nobility. A re, it was a real castle. And we were living like what they would call the servant's quarter. But when my mother, wherever my mother went, my mother was a woman who was loved by everyone she met. So when my mother managed to save us from the Velodrome d'Hiver, and that we managed to escape from the hospital, from Rue Lamarque, we went to this place where my young sister was born. But in a smaller village next to them. It was called Arville par saint Agile. And over there, my mother wanted to rent, well, I guess she must have a few dollars, I mean, Frank. My mother wanted to rent, it was a one-room house, really. But the people of the village, it was a small village, maybe a couple of hundred people, they said to my mother, the lender is not going to rent to you. You are not one of us. You know, uh, it was mostly farmers, peasants, and they have totally a different accent than people who come from Paris. And see, the lender would never rent to you. Well, the lender arrived, and my mother started to talk to him, but in the patois of the people of the village imitating them totally. And the lender said, but of course, Madame Suica, we will rent, I will rent you the house. You are one of us. And we had the house, no electricity, no gas. My mother even managed to make cakes and pies and everything. I don't, I don't know how. And then, so we stayed for a while in this village. And actually, for quite a while, we had a big garden and we started to grow our own. This is why I wouldn't, I wouldn't live in the country if you pay me. <laughs> it's okay to visit. We stayed there long enough. We grew, we grew our vegetables, we had food. But for a while, every day, by our door, my mother would find lettuce, fruits, tomato, a lot. We didn't know who. One day, there was a man, his name, I found out afterward, was Monsieur Fougereux. He was a blacksmith, the man who does the horseshoe on, on horses, blacksmith. And he came once and he said to my mother, oh, Madame Suica, I see that my vegetables are very good for your complexion. My mother had beautiful skin. 
and that's how we found out. And the thing is, we stayed there for a while, and then the German came to occupy the village. And the commandant, the head, occupied now the big, no, it was not a castle, but like the main big house where the mayor of the village was, of course. And we were living like, uh, well, let's say this was our house. And just over there, at the corner, was another big house that was occupied by a lot of German soldiers, was a corner house, and the German soldiers were there. And always with a rifle. My mother said to us, children, you have to know, if you are going to say that we are Jewish, you see this people with a rifle, they will kill us. If we understood or not, I don't know, but... And the thing is that when my mother would cook and bake, the smell would go like all over the village. Mm -hmm. And the German people at the corner asked if my mother would make some for them. She couldn't say no, right? And they brought in bags of flour and sugar and everything. My mother made some for us, of course, but who could say no? What would happen to us? And, but the commandant, he realized my mother was not one of the peasants and he wanted to go out with my mother. And every time she said to him, you know, I cannot go out. I have a son 14 year old. And she tried the best she could to get all kinds of excuses not to go out with him. But how long can she hold on? So one night, my mother decided we're going to escape and go to another small village. So but while we were, uh, things are coming back to me, while we were there before that, there were many uh, instances where things happened. Like one time we knew that there were some young parachutists, I believe they were English, who fell from a plane and they were, of course, prisoners. We never heard about them. Then they had some Russian prisoners. And where we were living, in the back of the house was a very big garden. And there was a big wall. Behind the wall was almost like a forest. It was part of that big house that the German occupied now. And we knew there was a big lake there. One night we heard shots and we heard uh, moans like somebody's hurt. People from the village afterwards, they were saying that that lake had a lot of blood. We never saw these people again. One day, my mother used to hang outside the white sheets and one night we heard plane going above us. We didn't know if they were allied or if they were enemies. So my mother at night, she ran outside to remove the white sheets because we didn't know what could happen. Another day, we so bomb falling and we had a big like a big closet my mother said children let's all go into the closet you come around me if the bomb falls on the house then 
at least we will all be together. We will either die all together or whatever, but we will be together one way or the other. Because if one of us die and the other one can be an orphan, so we all went into the uh, big closet and the bomb fell not too far away. I remember we went to see it. The hole that it made is like a big crater. It's just unbelievable. I don't know if it was the German, we don't know if it was the... But we had several episodes like this. But then that night, after I think a good couple of weeks, I am sure, because how long could my mother tell the commandant that she cannot go out? And after, when we escaped to another village, it was in a, in a remote little country lane. One house was here, one house was there. And I, I say to people, we, when people ask if any of us is allergic, my answer is we are all children. We are not allergic to anything because we were never sick. I remember we didn't have water in the house. My mother would go to a well, take like on little house on the prairie, <laughs> take house uh, uh, water from the well into a bucket. She would take a white sheet, uh, like use as a, as a um, strainer, if you want to say, because in the well are little, uh, either little fly or something. And so the clean water would come underneath. I remember my mother putting like a tablet. I don't know what it was, maybe to purify the water, but this is how we got the water and we stay in that house it was a big garden again there were so many uh, peach tree and pears and everything in the meantime we knew that my father was alive and that my father managed to go to switzerland which was a neutral country he was in a um, Ah, travailleur libre. It was not a concentration camp, but you still call it a camp, where people were there and they work for room and board. Father over there became a shoemaker, mm. from a milliner to a shoemaker. And through the Red Cross, we knew that he was alive and he got news that we were alive through the Red Cross. While we were in the village, in order to have money for us to survive, my mother used to buy uh, butter, eggs, chicken, and go to Paris to sell them to rich family on the black market. And my mother used to spend the night plucking the children, the <laughs> Sorry, the chicken, and she would walk several kilometers to go to the train station, to go to Paris. She was telling us that sometimes she would feel so low because this nouveau riche, you know, a uh, lot of people became very wealthy during the war. Some people lost everything, like we did, but some became very wealthy. and. They used to let my mother stay like in the foyer. They didn't invite her to the living room. And, and my mother would earn money this way. But one time, my mother didn't come back for two days. And we thought, that's it. We are, we are orphaned. We will never see our mother again. And after two days, my mother came back. She had been arrested, but she was lucky that the person who arrested her uh, accepted her money and he let her go. But like I say, when we were in the village, everybody there knew we were Jewish. 
but because my mother was so loved by everyone who met her. There was not one person who could say a bad word about my mother. If not, they would tell the German right away that we were Jewish. No one would say one word. But when we started, when we, as we went to the other small village, now all of a sudden the German became suspicious. What is it that all of a sudden this family is not near? Could they be Jewish? It dawned on them. Why all of a sudden we are not there? And they took the mayor and a few dignitaries, if you can call them, of the village, and they say, we're going to be looking for them. And if we don't find them, you will all be shot. Nobody would say anything. They knew where we were. I am sure of that. And they started to look for us. And trust me, they would have found us in a few hours. But again, luck was with us. It was towards the end of the war and they were called back to Germany. So then we are there in our little house and we hear my mother that night had again a dream where she heard the French anthem, La Marseillaise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when she woke up, she said, children, we are going to be liberated. And all of a sudden, we heard the bells of the church in the village ringing. We didn't know why. If there was a, a wedding, we were invited. If there was a baptism, we were invited. No bar mitzvah there. <laughs> uh, I was going to say that. If there was anything important, we will know. My mother said, children, the Americans are coming. Now, this was August 15. But was it 44 or 45? No, it had to be 44. We started to run. My mother, I remember, had a hand with flour that she was wiping on her apron. We started to run and run and run. And from far away, we saw the tanks passing by with the American. They came in that village and then they were pitching tents in a big open field and everybody would come over there and they would give candies and chewing gum, chocolate that we didn't know what it was. Chewing gum, I don't even know if we knew. And to the young woman, they had stockings and things, you know. But what was also very sad in a way is that in this village, during these few years where it was occupied by the German for quite a long time, some young women had children. We, of course, we don't know if they were raped, we don't know if they accepted, whatever doesn't matter. What they did to this young woman, they, I remember, they shaved their hair and they had them walking on the street. You know, like if they were branded, you know, like with the A letter or something, the red letter. And mainly, I'm sure it was not their fault because these were a young girl, 16, 17, 18, young girl. What did they know anyway? And, but this was, this was the, the end of the war. I don't think, I don't, no, my father didn't come to this place. We, after that, we went back to Paris. And like I say, there was nothing in the apartment. We had to start from scratch. And then my father came back from Switzerland. We were. I mean, in 1945, uh, May 8 was really the end of the war where all the, everything was signed. Everything was kosher, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and my father did not have any more any of these machines to go back to be a milliner. So he bought uh, sewing machines. And we had some people also working for us. The big thing 
was um, like a reversible raincoat, if you want to say. We girls, we went back to school. It was a school in the neighborhood. We would come home for lunch. So my mother was making breakfast, a big lunch for us when we came. Then we came back from school four o'clock, again a snack. Then about seven, again some food. When I think about my mother was all day working. She helped my father in the factory also. We felt different in a way that you have to realize, let's say if I take myself, even in 1945, I was only 11 years old. So I was really a child. The one who really felt the difference was my mother. Because my father was shielded, if you want to say, from the war because Thanks to my mother, who hid him, he managed to escape. So my mother did not have my father mm -hmm. to take care of her and us during the war. So especially for my mother, life had changed a lot. Uh, my mother and I, and even with, our, uh, with my other sister and brother, we really didn't talk about the war about the experience during the war. Um, I, guess, I guess she wanted to put it behind her and go forward because it was, my mother had it very, very hard during the war and after the war because we had to start everything from scratch. Everything that we had in the apartment, everything, we had nothing. My, and it is my mother who had to take care of everything. So she was the one who had everything on her shoulder, really. Although my father was the breadwinner, but I don't think he could have done it without my mother. If we, I am not, I, I mean, I don't want to belittle my father for sure, but I don't think that if the role would be reversed and that we would have stayed with my father instead of my mother, I don't think I would be here talking to you today. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm, almost, I'm almost sure I wouldn't.